Thank you for that. Oh, I love Maureen Cora again. Let's hear it for Maureen. And if you haven't read her book, Leave Me Alone, I'm Reading, <laughs> she is, it's terrific. Um, thank you for this. Thank you to the Washington Post. I, it's so wonderful that you support this festival. Thank you to the Library of Congress who busts their ass. That's a literary term if you have a, everyone working so, so hard, tons of volunteers to bring this to you. So I'm very, very grateful and very, very honored. And plus I have like this hot guy signing. <laughs> Now we're having fun. <laughs> well, I thought, as usual, I would tell you some silly stories and then try to tell you something important. I wonder if that part is possible. But I think I want to start with a thank you. It's a thank you to librarians. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. I owe you big time. I grew up in a wonderful house in South Philly, you know by my accent and my really large nose. As my mother said, we get more oxygen than you. If I breathe in, you can't. But I didn't, in my house, we had lots of love and lots of meatballs and one book. What was the book? The Bible. Aren't you sweet? No. How do you sign no? No. No Bible. The book was TV Guide. We didn't read. We watched TV, which is great. I was the kid who, like my mother would say, stop reading, it will ruin your eyes. And she was right. But I didn't stop reading. If it weren't for a librarian, and tons of librarians, I would not be standing before you. I discovered books in the school library where I found that not only were they all, you know, like a little bit bigger than I thought, and they didn't have Lucille Ball on the cover, which was excellent. And I was that kid wandering around the stacks thinking, why can I only take out 12? And you know, that was in the days, I'll take you back, because I'm 54, oh yes. How do you sign 54? No. You, that's how you sign 54. No. I'm kid. Um, back then, I went to the library and I didn't know how to choose a book because my dad, God bless him, brought me to the library and sat in the car and waited like a dog because why would he go in the library because there's no TV. Now there's TV, he will go to the library. But then I'm so morning around trying to figure out what, to, what should I read? Well, you know, you, that were the days going back when uh, the card, do you remember the card in back actually stayed with the same book? God bless us. And you could go, well, I'd look at the handwriting of, the, she seems nice, this must be a good book. Or look at all these signatures, this must be a really good book. Or if you're me, you start to look at those spines. Now on the spine, there was a picture of a guy with a really big nose and a hat. And I'm like, that looks like my Uncle Rocky. I think I will read these Uncle Rocky books. And then I got older and I found out that the guy was not Uncle Rocky, but Sherlock Holmes. And uh, I think that's why I'm a mystery writer. But the real important thing that a library did and librarians did for me is this, and I want to take you back for a minute. Because do you remember your first library card? I do. You don't know where your car keys are, do you? But you know what your library card looked like. Mine was orange and small and it had a metal plate and it had numbers. And when I would go home from the library, because they would have inked it up, you could press your thumb onto it and mine was 3937. Why do I remember that? The answer is simple. If you think back to when you were little, and you know everybody else had dri driver's licenses and credit cards and they got mail. Do you remember when you wanted mail? 
wow, you know, so you got mail. Well, I think that what happens to a kid, or at least what happened to me, was that that library card is the first piece of identification you get in life. And if you're a kid like me, where the family loves you, but no one at home is saying reading is a good thing at all, you think, I read, therefore I matter. The, I am among people, as I am now today, who love books. We all make our little families as we get older, and as wonderful as my meatball-loving family was, the family that loved books is just as terrific. And it was libraries that gave that to me. And they give that to all of us. I think they give it to all of you. They build community for you. The Library of Congress is building a national community where the dialogue is about how important books are. And it isn't that reading is fundamental, which they, I hate that. I mean, can we do better? Really, because reading is connects people. Reading nurtures us. Reading enriches us. That's why book clubs work. You know, I, I, I think about fiction, and I'm getting off point, but in fiction, what I real they'll call them thrillers, they'll call them, they'll put covers, on the cover there's legs, there's always legs. Legs sell things, I don't know why, because they're the last to go, but... <laughs> I am opening my heart in these books. These books I think of as stories about ordinary women, and I always think of that great quote by Alice, Alice was one. Eleanor Roosevelt, thinking of her niece, which was, a woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong she is until she's in hot water. Isn't that what I write? Isn't that what I write? Let's hear it for tea bags. It's all Nancy Drew, only in better clothes. And with a car and still not with a boyfriend. How do you sign still not with a boyfriend? <laughs> I might be in love. <laughs> where do you get your ideas? Here's where you get your ideas if you're a tea bag. One is a memory. I'm walking with my mom. I'm seven. We're in South Philly, a mythical place. A car pulls up, curvy, big, big guy, you know. <laughs> bumpers, bumpers. And a convertible, the woman behind the wheel, piles of black hair, black, black eyebrows, red, red lips, dramatic. I'm seven, I remember this person like it was yesterday. I'm walking with my mother. My mother sees the driver, she says, oh, watch this. She walks over to the car. The woman driver cranks the window up in her face. My mother comes back to the curb laughing. I say, who was that? She says, that was my sister. I can't believe this. Now I'm going to tell you now. I told this today, so I have to tell it. This is embarrassing because I want you to be impressed by me. That's why I wore the underwire. But the real truth. Shameless. I've lost it, haven't I? The real truth is that my mother is the youngest of 19 children. Yeah, and she didn't even have her, like, a reality show for it. They're just good Catholics, really good Catholics. We always say that there were two husbands and the first one died, and you know how. Okay, so I have a lot of aunts and uncles, but I thought I knew all my aunts and uncles until that day, and I said to my mother, well, how can that be your sister? That's your Aunt Lena, we don't speak. We haven't spoken in 17 and a half years. Really, why? Because she brought a gun to a wedding, her daughter's wedding. I'm like, okay. Enough. TMI, too much information. So at some point recently, I start to go, that, that could be a novel. And that becomes the vendetta defense. Because it's about a family feud, and you don't have to be Italian to have a blood feud, damn it. <laughs> right? It just comes from life. Everything... Another time... All right. I, there is a knock at the door, to make a long story short. A woman is there looking a lot like me, and she says, hi, I'm your half-sister, and I really love your books. I'm like, really? <laughs> Come in, and then she tells a story, because I'm looking at her, and her blue eyes are my father's eyes, and, 
you know, I kind of always wanted a sister, but I never thought that past age 35 I would get one. I mean, I wanted a pony too, but I bought that. And I say, gee, who now look? Come in. She said, well, you're fine. This is kind of dirty laundry <laughs> broadcast in the national. Isn't it kind of? Oh. Why do I start and then want to stop? Um, she says, well, actually what happened is your father is my birth father. Uh, he had an affair when he went to University of California at Berkeley, which is just where that would happen. Because if you stayed in Philadelphia, you would actually, you know, behave yourself. But if you go to Berkeley, you're going to lose it. And the child's produced, and she's a wonderful kid. And before you feel sorry for her, she had a wonderful adoptive experience, and I got the crazy Scottolinis. Okay? But here she comes back, and she wants, she finds me because his name's on the birth certificate, and your mouth is hanging open. It's scary. <laughs> And the bottom line is, I grew up thinking that, you know, in my family, blood and tomato sauce are very thick. But when this woman walks into my life, I realize I'm looking at family, and she is a complete and total stranger to me. And the experience I had that year was that I was found when I didn't know I was lost. And I said, that's a book. <laughs>